Okay, well, thanks for the introduction. Um, this is going to be a presentation about uh, GPRS Edge, UMTS, HSPA, and other acronyms that uh, exist in the cellular um, data communication world. Um, let me start with sort of a rhetorical question. How many people in this room have never used any of these technologies? <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, that's one, one uh, lone. Uh, okay. Um, the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, sort of, I mean, this is not a presentation about some cool hacks or some exploits or some security issues or anything like that. It's just a talk about how some technology works. And I think the last time that I remember uh, such types of talks was probably something like 10 years or longer ago at the CCC where we had something like TCP IP introduction, right? And, and this is probably the same kind of talk, but for entirely different protocols, which are not any newer, at least some of them are not newer than, than these talks that we had 10 years ago or something. But um, I think it's, um, it's sort of a, um, a mystery and a problem why there is technology that's so widespread. There are, there are literally uh, more than a billion terminals out there on this planet that speak at least one of the protocols uh, uh, outlined in this presentation, and yet there are very few people who actually understand how uh, this uh, works if you go beyond the user traffic. Of course, well, if we, if we use a mobile phone to transfer internet data, TCP IP uh, data, uh, then, of course, everyone understands the TCP IP layers on top, but what about the, I don't know, five to seven, maybe ten layers below that? Um, uh, you know, who, who understands them and uh, who does something about them? Okay, well, um, let's start with a slightly historical um, uh, excursion. Um, CSD, I'm not sure how many in this room remember what CSD is. Um, it's uh, circuit switch data. Um, and it was the first technology in digital cellular uh, um, telephony systems uh, to transmit uh, data between uh, terminals, uh, not voice. So um, GSM is the first, to, to the best of my knowledge, is the first digital cellular system. It was developed in the 1980s. And that's something you always have to keep in mind. This goes back uh, a very long time. GSM has first been deployed around 1990. And it's a pure circuit switch technology. So in, if, you're, if you're correct or if you're uh, true to the word, then GSM does not have any gate data capabilities except, uh, in, except a CSD. Um, we'll get to that. Um, circuit switch means uh, it's like a voice call. You dial a number, you establish a connection, and then you exchange data. So CSD sort of emulates the behavior of what people used uh, in the 1990s uh, uh, like um, modems on, on the public uh, telephone network. And the data rates uh, that you can achieve using CSD are uh, sort of funny today. And it's 2,400, 4,800, and so on, bits per second. It's not megabits or kilobits, uh, bits, uh, whole bits, not half bits or quarter bits. Um, <coughs> I'm mentioning this because GSM on the lower layers has lots of quarter bits. Um, okay. Now, uh, CSD is still supported by some operators today, but I'm not really going to cover it for the remainder of this talk. This is just, uh, uh, this is where all this is coming from. Um, it's circuit switched, it's not packet switched, that's sort of the, the important thing to notice. Um, then there was HSCSD, I'm not sure how many people remember that. It's uh, channel bundling CSD. So imagine CSD is like you have a, an analog phone line and two modems on the ends and you communicate and now you have two or three or four of these phone lines and you get the aggregate bandwidth of them. It's not very surprising. So um, there was uh, uh, the option to, to run uh, 38.4 kilobits and, and 57.6 kilobits, both very popular data transmission rates in analog uh, telephony systems using modems. So uh, HSCSD was able to deliver those bandwidths over GSM um, however, it was very expensive because, well, if you have four, if you occupy four circuits uh, in a circuit switch systems, you have to pay four times the amount of money, of course. And also, you get four times the amount of load. So, um, yeah, I think it was popular for a very short time. I still have a couple of phones that support it, but um, it's dead uh, ever since GPRS came around. Now, GPRS, the General Packet Radio Service, was specified almost a decade later than GSM. Um, and first deployed in a production network in 1999. G 
GPRS is not an extension of GSM, really. It is a separate network that just shares the same uh, TDMA structure, the same modulation, the same channels, the same bandwidth, and so on. But logically, it's really an entirely different network. And uh, your phone can register to GSM, but not to GPRS, and vice versa. Um, because those are two independent activities and two independent transactions that end up at different units in the network. The reason for this design is uh, that uh, GSM networks had already been deployed for about 10 years before uh, uh, GPRS came around. And now the engineers had the task of sort of uh, implementing a packet radio system that can reuse as much as possible on the radio transmission side, the same modems, the same, uh, said, same TDMA structure, and so on but uh, uh, add these services without making too many modifications to the very well working and stable circuit switch side. So this is why there is a, a, a different infrastructure for that. Um, the base stations are the same, but anything beyond the base station is different in, in a GPRS uh, network. It's packet switch, not circuit switched. So um, it's the first uh, uh, cellular technology that uh, a digital cellular technology that allows you to send uh, packets um, where you don't need to allocate an entire circuit of dedicated bandwidth for your data session. Um, the bandwidth was around 56 to 114 kilobits per second. You cannot really say that very clearly because it depends on um, the exact multi-slot uh, class support of the mobile station and the base station and uh, various other aspects. Uh, so it's, it's in that range uh, typically with most of the phones. It's uh, available, it was and is available virtually anywhere in the world except Japan and Korea um, because uh, they had uh, different uh, 2G, 2.5G systems. Now, edge. Um, many people talk about edge. Edge means enhanced data rates for GSM evolution. Uh, you will notice that evolution is an extremely important term in uh, cellular technology because everything is always either evolved or evolving or evolve, uh, evolution. So. It's, um, uh, yeah. So, um, technically speaking, edge is a superset of what people think it is. Um, there is edge consists out of eGPRS and eCSD. Um, but eCSD, almost nobody knows. Um, and most people just think of eGPRS when they say edge. Uh, or actually, well, they think of edge, but they mean eGPRS. eGPRS now means we use the eGPRS network, but we add a little bit in terms of a different modulation scheme uh, and in terms of uh, slightly different uh, um, uh, channel coding, and uh, we get higher bandwidth than the old system. It uses the same uh, radio channels, the same bandwidth, the same time slots, everything is like GPRS, but it uses eight phase uh, shift keying, eight PSK, instead of uh, the Gaussian minimum shift keying that GSM does. There are no real changes to any of the higher protocol layers except some small information elements where you signal the availability of, of, uh, of uh, this system. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, entirely the same. Most phones support something like 236 kilobits per second. And again, like GPRS, it's available almost anywhere in the world. Now, UMTS. Um, I'm just going through the history first, and then we look uh, more in detail into the individual systems. Uh, well, there are obviously uh, multiple typos in this slide. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, it's the Universal Mobile Telephony sub, uh, System, not SUB, uh, just system. Uh, it developed uh, around 96 to 99. Um, so uh, once again, it's sort of developed at the same time as GPRS, but uh, uh, for UMTS, since it's a completely different system, people needed new phones, and uh, um, so it was expected to take a longer time to pick up, and it was a new, more expensive technology, so it was sort of rectified to develop um, GPRS and UMTS in parallel. First commercial deployment also was three years after the first commercial deployment of GPRS networks, and UMTS in its core specification actually also doesn't really have that, much, that, that high data rates. It's so 384 kilobits downstream and downlink to the phone and 128 kilobits on the uplink. Uh, it's not uh, all that exciting if you think about it. Um, it's an entirely new system. It's not a logical uh, sort of extension or enhancement of the previous systems, but it's an entirely new system. It's based on a modulation scheme called wideband, double, uh, wideband CDMA, uh, where CDMA is code division multiple access. 
And uh, uh, in, especially in the US, people always say it's a WCDMA network, which is correct to some extent, but it, I mean, there are, there are many other WCDMA systems which are not UMTS, so it's sort of an overgeneralization. Um, it supports circuit switched and packet switched services. So in, in UMTS, from the very beginning, um, they, uh, they were looking at um, developing a protocol and developing a system that can work for both circuit switched services and for packet switched services. Unlike GSM, which was entirely circuit switched, and then they had GPRS, which is entirely packet switched, and so on and so on. The fixed part of the network heavily uses ATM over synchronous digital hierarchy uh, systems. So um, the lower layers of anything that does not go over a radio interface, as you will see in the next couple of slides, uh, is almost always ATM based. Uh, so there you can see it, it's developed in a community um, where people thought OSI protocols are a great thing and ATM are a great thing and you know, all this strange IP and Ethernet stuff that other people do is sort of uh, amateur crap. Um, okay. Now, HSDPA is uh, uh, introducing a couple of uh, new downlink channels. It's high-speed downlink packet access. Um, it's the HSDSCH, the high-speed downlink shared channel. It was added in UMTS release five. Uh, the specifications are released in, in releases and uh, they are numbered uh, up to 98. They were based on uh, the, the name of the year. So there's uh, release 98 uh, or release 99, which are uh, released in the respective uh, year of the calendar. But uh, the further numbering does not necessarily correspond to any year. Um, and some other physical channels that are uh, sort of below this uh, um, new channel. And uh, it introduces uh, adaptive modulation up to 64 QAM, so relatively uh, complex modulation schemes and initially permitted 3.6 megabit second downlink. Um, and it also increases the uplink a slight bit from 128 to 384, but it's also not that impressive. HSUPA um, is uh, actually called EUL, enhanced uplink. HSUPA is a marketing term from Nokia. Um, and uh, it uses similar techniques as HSDPA, uh, but uh, in the uplink direction. Uh, yeah, 5.76 megabits is sort of the then there is HSPA Plus, which is the latest uh, extension to those standards, um, which was added uh, in release 7 of the specification, and it permits ac up to 84 megabits in downlink and 22 megabits in uplink uh, by using MIMO techniques, QAM64, and also by combining actually two cells. So a single phone can use two cells simultaneously in order to extend the bandwidth beyond what a single cell could provide. It's a theoretical maximum of 186 megabits, uh, which uh, is theoretical, of course. Um, and, uh, uh, but nonetheless, it's uh, fairly impressive what they managed to squeeze out by evolving um, the uh, uh, UMTS technology further and further without going into LTE, the next uh, one around. Okay, now let's look at these individually uh, uh, in a bit more detail. At CSD, I'm skipping. It's not really all that interesting. Um, let's look at our standard diagram of uh, a GSM and GPRS network. Um, we have our mobile phone somewhere over here on the left-hand side, uh, which connects over a radio interface called the UM interface to a device called the BTS, the base transceiver station. From there, it's backhauled over a, a typically an E1 line, uh, running a set of protocols called ABIS, um, to a device called the BSC, the base station controller, which connects to something called the PCU, the packet control unit, um, which then in turn uses another E1 line uh, with another set of protocols uh, called the GB interface to the serving GPRS support node, the SGSN on the, on the bottom here. The SGSN um, is taking care of mobility management, encryption, um, compression, uh, and all kinds of things for the actual data that gets transmitted to the phones over here. Also, authentication is handled by the SGSN in GPRS. Um, and the SGSN then connects over a GN interface to the GGSN. The GGSN is the gateway GPRS support node, and it's where the IP packets are, the tunnels terminate towards the internet. So, those entire nodes in this network establish transparent tunnels between the GGSN and the MS, uh, the mobile station, the phone on the other hand side. Um, the GGSN is the only IP-only device in the network. Um, everything else is not really 
doesn't really deal with IP. There's just some user data which we encapsulate somehow and we wrap it enough so we don't really have to touch the IP. Um, uh, needs to be properly wrapped uh, to be able to transport it over our ATM and E1 and, and SDH and whatever other technologies. So, um, if uh, you look at the control plane stacking, um, what's the control plane? Well, the control plane is anything that's not your user data. Uh, control plane is about setting up connections, uh, authentication, taking care of handover, mobility management, all these kind of things. That's the control plane. Um, and the user plane is where you actually have your IP data, the, your internet uh, uh, data that you want to transmit. Now the control plane, let's uh, first explain the diagram a little bit. We have the individual nodes um, uh, listed here. There's the MS, the mobile station. It's not Microsoft, it's uh, the mobile station. Um, it may run an operating system from Microsoft though. Um, there is uh, the BTS and the CCU, the circuit control unit, um, uh, which is the, the node represented here. Then we have the BSC, the base station controller, and the packet control unit, um, the SGSN uh, here. And for the control plane, I didn't put uh, the GGSN here, but uh, for example, the HLR, uh, which is uh, where your subscriber data is stored and uh, also uh, involved in, in uh, for example, it, it lists what kind of uh, what kind of services you have subscribed to or not, this kind of data uh, is, is stored in, in the HLR over here. Now, the, the, the dashed lines are the individual interfaces between those nodes, and uh, the interfaces have always these uh, strange names, uh, like UM, ABIS, GB, G, Z, and GN, and, and all these uh, uh, small uh, names. Now, as you can see, there's a physical layer. The physical layer exists over the radio interface between the phone and the BTS. Um, and then we have other protocols on top. There's a MAC, an RSC, an LLC protocol. Um, the two lower ones, the, the medium access control and the radio link control, RLC and MAC layers, they terminate in actually the PCU here, the packet control unit. Um, and uh, they are transparently passed not only over the radio interface here, this is your only radio interface, it's the UM, UM interface, and this is uh, typically an E1 type line here on the backhaul, and they're transparently passed over here. They terminate in the packet control unit, um, which uh, then re-encapsulates the payload, which is LLC, logical link control protocol. It gets encapsulated in a new protocol called BSSGP, the base station subsystem gateway protocol, um, which gets uh, then encapsulated in the NS, uh, the, uh, I think it's network service uh, protocol, which then gets put into frame relay, which gets put on top of an E1 line. Um, and then it gets backhauled to the SGSN, that's a sort of a centralized node in the network, um, which then implements this entire same stack here, E1 with frame relay with NS with BSSGP, but then also terminates the LLC layer, which is coming directly from the mobile phone. And then on top of that, we have two sub-layers called GMM, GPRS Mobility Management, and SM, which is not what you think it is, it is Session Management. Um, and um, all these terminate here, basically. There is nothing that doesn't terminate at the SGSN in the control plane. And uh, then towards, for example, oops, sorry, that's the next slide, uh, towards the, um, uh, the, uh, the home location register, which is like your subscriber database, um, there's an entirely different set of protocols, uh, usually referred to as SS7, but more specifically, it is an E1 line with MTP level 2 on top, MTP is message transfer part, MTP level 3 on top, SCCP on top, TCAP, uh, the transaction capabilities application part, um, and then MAP, the mobile application part. Um, and uh, those uh, exist on completely different interfaces. So, what you can see from this is that each and every interface has a completely different protocol stacking. Um, these protocols are independently specified. They're most often specified by different working groups. You can see, when you read the specs, you can clearly see it's written by different people. Um, they do not, you know, use the same encoding. They do not use the same information elements and so on. So each of those protocol stacks is an entirely different beast um, that you encounter depending on the interface. Now, this is the control plane. Now, I'm going to talk about what happens on this control plane um, uh, just uh, in another slide. I'm just going to uh, uh, go through the user plane um, to 
uh, show you how, this, how deep the stacking actually is. Now, let's assume you make on your smartphone, you do an HTTP request that gets into TCP, of course, gets encapsulated into IP, which then gets encapsulated in my favorite protocol. It comes st straight out of Star Trek. It's called the Sub Network Dependent Convergence Protocol, the SNDCP. <laughs> uh, you have to, yeah. Scotty, you have to remodulate the Sub Network Dependent Convergence Protocol. It wouldn't, it's uh, uh, Ah, we have, we have fluctuations in the BSS GP. No. So, um, the SNDCP, then the LLC, then the RLC, then the MAC, and then we finally can transmit it. Um, and almost all of them get transparently passed through the BTS. Some of them then terminate at the uh, packet control unit here. Another couple of them on the SGSN, and finally the user data gets passed over to the GGSN where it can enter, uh, how can I say, the, the, uh, the strange world of IP-based networks. Um, so when you're thinking about all your, I don't know, um, web uh, vulnerabilities or, or whatever kind of uh, higher level application level stuff, you're, you're up here and there's lots of other stuff which uh, a lot of people don't really look at in detail below. Okay, now, what are these individual layers? Medium access control, sort of, I mean, almost every physical layer has a medium access control layer. I don't need to say much about that. Um, these numbers that you can see, the like 44.060, I put them in here for a reference. So if you want to learn more about these respective layers, this is what you type into Google or your favorite search engine, or you go directly to the 3GPP uh, website and uh, uh, look up this specification. It's on top of what's called a PDTCH, a packet data tra uh, traffic channel. Um, it's a physical channel on the, on the air interface. And on top of Mac, you have RLC, um, which takes care of, uh, uh, well, radio link control is the name. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, there's too many typos in those slides. I s apologize, I will fix that immediately. Um, it, the resource allocation, like which phone gets how many time slots and gets which amount of bandwidth and so on, is always determined by the network, of course, right? It's not like uh, uh, some random uh, uh, arbitration or like you have on Ethernet where you have something like uh, CSMA CD uh, and everyone can just try to send packets at any given point in time. No, no, no. This is not an unorganized Ethernet network. It's a very well structured, well thought through um, professional communications protocol. Um, and um, because it's so professional, of course, um, uh, it cannot rely on, uh, I don't know, human readable message definitions. The messages have to be specified in a uh, syntax, in an abstract, well, no, actually not in an abstract syntax, but in a parsable, machine readable syntax. And because uh, there weren't enough of these syntaxes so far, uh, they invented something called the CSN1, the concrete syntax notation, which is uh, very different from ASN, the abstract syntax notation. Huh? <laughs> so. Um, it's much more concrete uh, in a sense. <laughs> in the sense uh, that, you know, in ASN1, you have the syntax and you have the encoding rules, and uh, that's not very concrete. So in CSN1, uh, there's no separation between the two. There's only one possible encoding, and that's part of the, the uh, specification. By the way, the specification costs something like 10 euros, and it's only available printed, and you have to order it from France and um, uh, have to do a wire transfer to their bank account and so on. It's quite funny. It's the, I mean, I think the amount of overhead they have for charging these 10 euros is sort of, uh, well. Okay, now, um, the GB layers. The GB is, again, the interface between the BTS and the BSC slash PCU. Um, there's the network service layer specified in 0816 which sort of maintains a possibly redundant set of uh, physical links on top of frame relay. Um, it does things like failover and load sharing among multiple links uh, because uh, sometimes one E1 line is just not enough. You need multiple of them and uh, then uh, you need to somehow uh, share the load. Um, it's originally specified over frame relay, um, but sometimes actually people put a Cisco router behind it to encapsulate the frame relay in IP. Um, so then you have 
Th then you have the entire stack uh, that I indicated, uh, where is it, here. Well, something like this stack up to NS in frame relay in uh, some uh, other encapsulation in IP and, and some, some other layers on the bottom. Uh, but then some other people also came up with the bright idea of putting NS directly into IP, uh, well, sort of via UDP. So you can skip the frame relay part if you want. Um, now, on top of that, there is BSS GP, um, which uh, maintains things called BSS GP virtual connections, BVCs. Um, and each base transceiver station in your uh, base station subsystem now establishes one logical connection. It's called a BVC, a, a, a BSS GP virtual connection between the STSN and, and this BTS. Uh, BSSGP also um, uh, implements flow control uh, and, and it's actually a, a hierarchy of, flow con of, of token bucket filters um, which are sort of uh, uh, encapsulated into each other. So there is one flow control for all the data going to one B, uh, BTS because of course you have an E1 link and at some point you might saturate that so you need to have flow control on the entire link. And then you have flow control for each individual mobile station that connects to that BTS. And then you can have individual packet flows inside uh, contexts of each individual f uh, phone, which again have these uh, flow control. Uh, um, so you have this hierarchy of three levels of flow control um, that uh, make sure uh, you're not uh, flooding the BTS with packets coming from uh, the high bandwidth internet, which want to squeeze through the tiny uh, radio interface between the phone and uh, uh, the network because you have you have your bottleneck here that's typically your bottleneck is uh, the uh, radio link here but the packets of course come in from the internet over here and somehow you need to make sure that uh, you're not flooding that link uh, uh, in a completely unfair or undeterministic way um, bssgp is extremely inefficient if you think of it in terms of overhead because each and every bssgp message which is each and every of your TCP ACKs, let's say you have a TCP ACK packet, it's like 20 bytes TCP header plus 20 bytes IP header plus a little bit of SNDCP header plus a couple of bytes LLC headers plus a, a frame check sequence of 32 bits at the end of LLC plus the VSSGP header. And the VSSGP header now um, includes the full IMZ, the full radio access capabilities information element, which can easily be something like 30 bytes. Um, so in the end, you want to send a single acknowledgement back to your phone and uh, on these interfaces here, you might easily say, see 100 bytes or even more um, for that for the single acknowledgement. So that's just something to keep in mind in terms of efficiency. Okay, now on top of that, we have my favorite, as I said, SNDCP. Um, it, uh, well, SNDCP is, uh, too many typos in here. LLC is between SNDCP and uh, the, uh, the lower layers. Um, let's talk about LLC first. It supports acknowledged and unacknowledged mode, but normally for IP communication, it's mostly used in unacknowledged mode. Um, uh, LLC actually, you might have heard in different contexts. I think uh, LLC goes back to IBM mainframes, actually, um, where in SNA networks, uh, there were LLC uh, was one of the protocols uh, used uh, in those networks. It's uh, though a, a different, uh, sorry, a specific variant for GPRS networks that we have here. Um, the encryption of GPRS happens on this LLC layer um, and as well checksumming uh, of uh, the frames uh, also happens on this layer. SNDCP now is on top of that and it's a general purpose uh, encapsulation for the packet data because when GPRS was designed, uh, once again, remember the uh, sort of, well, mid-1990s. Um, I mean, uh, a lot of people were already using the internet, uh, at least uh, that's how I remember it. But um, in the cellular industry and in the professional communications industry, they were still thinking of X25 and the OSI protocols and, and all the marvels uh, of X400 and, and all those things. and. Um, it was designed in a way that it can transmit, uh, can transfer IP as well as other protocols such as X25. So you can actually have X25 over GPRS um, uh, in, in accordance with the, the, the specifications. If we actually look at IP today, um, uh, the SNDCP also takes care of IP header compression. 
um, and also possibly V42 payload compression. Um, so uh, it, there can be arithmetic uh, compression of, of the data uh, built into this uh, level. If you look at the control plane, what is GMM? GMM is uh, mobility management, which well, is like mobility management GSM. If you know about that, uh, then it's easy to, to, to guess what it does. Um, it doesn't use SNDCP, only LLC and the remaining part of the stack. It's responsible for things like routing area update. This basically is your phone telling the network where it currently is located. Um, things like attach and detach when you switch on and switch off your phone or enter, enter airplane mode or leave it. Uh, it also does uh, take care of authentication, which is the same authentication method that GSM uses, using the same keys, by the way, um, and the same algorithms. Uh, it also reallocates uh, the temporary identifier. GSM has a TIMZ, GPRS has a P TIMZ. Uh, in, in, it's also something important, anything that's in G, in, if you look at GPRS, everything has to start with a P. So um, you have the TCH, the traffic channel in GSM, and you have the PTCH, the packet traffic channel in G, uh, GPRS. You have the BCCH in GSM, and you have the PBCCH in GPRS because it's the packet broadcast control channel. There's also a, a provision for delivering SMS over GPRS, and uh, if you look at only the, the layer three transactions uh, on uh, between individual nodes uh, for uh, performing a, a routing area update, it looks a little bit like this. First, you have your, your layer one establishment, um, then uh, you establish the RLC uh, MAC layers, and then on the LLC level, you encapsulate the GMM messages, like uh, routing area update request. gets sent from the phone to the SGSN. Oops. Um, then the, the, the SGSN behaves a little bit like the MSC in, in GSM networks. So it uh, can do, for example, identity requests. It can ask the phone about its IMZ, its IMEI, that kind of stuff. And then on the backhand side, just like an MSC would do it in the circuit switch world, it can uh, ask the HLR and AUC uh, to provide authentication information for performing the cryptographic authentication, which is then performed here. Um, and then uh, on the map interface here to the HLR, we see uh, the location uh, update request, insert subscriber data, and so on. So really, if you, if you know how an MSC behaves in a circuit switch network, just replace MSC with SGSN, and most of the time things are pretty much the same. The next thing is session man management, uh, which maintains, establishes and maintains the tunnels to external in, uh, packet data networks. Um, so they don't talk about tunnels. You know? Everybody, I guess, in this room knows what an IP tunnel, a VPN tunnel, and so on is, but most people don't know what is a PDP context. It's exactly the same thing, it's just that they use a different name. Um, and of course, it has to start with P. So it's a PDP context, um, and it's not related to PDP 11. Um, you can have multiple of these contexts uh, active at any point in time. So actually, uh, it's not that your phone can only have one connection to the public internet, but you can have a number of different tunnels possibly terminating in different IP networks. It doesn't have to be the internet. I mean, uh, there are many other uh, options uh, available. Um, uh, for example, there are uh, companies that operate uh, M2M devices over GPRS. Uh, they uh, quite often have uh, their own tunnel endpoint, their own GGSN. And uh, uh, the, uh, so the IP data doesn't end up in the internet, but it ends up directly in their own IP network, which is not a public network. Um, the resolution of where do you connect to, which tunnel broker, uh, which is called GGSN, uh, do you use is done by the APN, the access point name. Um, the mapping from access point names to uh, IP addresses of the GGSN is done uh, by using DNS, and they have private DNS zones which are accessible only to the GSM operators for resolving those names and IP addresses. Um, and uh, then uh, the, the tunnel establishment is passed to that particular GGSN. If you look at that procedure, um, you have a channel establishment and so on and so on, and you see something called a PDP context activation request, which is a phone saying, I want to have an IP tunnel established now. Um, the SGSN will then make a DNS query on the APN that was specified by the phone, so like internet.eplus.whatever or something like that. Um, there will be a response to that DNS, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, the request, uh, and then the SGSN establishes a GTPC connection 
uh, to the GGSN um, and forwards that context activation request and uh, it will be acknowledged. Hopefully the acknowledgement will be forwarded and then from that point on you actually is, uh, exchange uh, IP packets uh, between the GGSN and your phone. This GTP protocol is uh, once again specified in one of these uh, fancy uh, specs uh, and 29060. Uh, it's the only protocol in, at, at that time which was specified over IP networks right from the beginning. The idea was that the GGSN is a IP, pure IP device. It doesn't have to have E1 connections. It doesn't have to have an SS7 stack. It doesn't have to have any of these fancy things. That's why Cisco built one of them. Um, uh, because, well, you know, uh, uh, they, want, they wanted the, the IP network vendors, the, the router and switch makers to, to be able to uh, build these devices. Um, uh, GTPC, the control side, is used for this uh, tunnel setup in teardown and the user playing GTPU for actual user data. On this interface, there's no authentication, no encryption, because it's only to be u intended to be used in intranets or uh, inter-operator links that are private anyway. So, um, might not be always the case, but at least that's how it was intended to be used. Okay, so far for GPRS. Let's move into more uh, current technologies. Um, UMTS packet switched uh, systems. Um, the higher layers like GMM and SM are actually reused from GPRS. There's no change on them. Um, this is li like the circuit switch domain. Uh, also the core control, for example, of, uh, that existed in GSM is uh, used, reused one by one in, in uh, UMTS. But all the other layers below, they're really uh, very different. Um, most of the, like the SGSN remains the same, the GGSN remains completely the same, but anything that relates to the radio access layer, to the BTSs uh, and so on, is not only different, but it's also called completely different. So there's no BTS, there's a Node B, there's no BSC, there's an RNC, so all these things. The, the, the mobile phone is no longer the MS, it's now the MT, so um, it uh, looks a little bit like this, uh, at least uh, if you use uh, uh, graphics that are available uh, online. Um, you have uh, node Bs, these are your individual cells, which are connected over a link called IUB to the RNC, the radio network uh, controller, which then connects to the SGSN here over an interface called IUPS, um, the IU interface for packet switched uh, PS uh, um, services. Um, if we look at the protocol stacking, uh, we will see some names that at least sound familiar, like MAC and RLC. They are different in implementation, though. Uh, would have been too easy. Um, we see a new protocol called RRC, the radio, uh, radio resource control. On top of that, we again, we have fa uh, familiar uh, names. GMM and SM are just the same. Um, on the bottom half, we have lots of new stuff that comes in because it's now ATM and not frame relay or E1. Or it might be E1 physically below the ATM, but uh, at least no frame relay. So you have all these adaption layers. If you've heard about AAL2 and AAL5, um, some, some people may be old enough to still have learned that in university. Um, uh, uh, these are all adaption layers, how you can encapsulate stuff on top of, on top of ATM cells and, and ATM virtual circuits below. Um, this is again the only radio interface that's specified and um, you can see again the node B doesn't really do anything. It just passes stuff on onto the wired interface here, onto IUB, to the RNC, which is uh, what, what used to be the BSC in, in uh, older networks, where a MAC, RLC and RRC layers terminate. RRC is translated into a different protocol on the same level called RANAP, the radio access, uh, radio access network application part. Um, and um, then RANAP is forwarded over SS7 actually. So you can see here uh, MTP3B for, for wideband uh, ATM links with SCCP on top or alternatively using a IP in ATM and then a SIGTRAN kind of stack uh, up here. So RANAP goes back to the SGSN where also again uh, SM and GMM terminate and the remaining part is just the same like in, in GPRS. Uh, if you look at the user plane, there is one new protocol also, is the PDCP, the Packet Data Convergence Protocol, I guess. Um, and um, then again, you can encapsulate your, your higher level protocols uh, in, inside uh, the PDCP protocol. 
Mac layers are specified in some specs. They have fancy numbers. Um, the RSC takes care of encryption, so the encryption is one layer level lower than in the in the GPRS networks. Uh, also takes care of segmentation, retransmission, and so on. Interestingly, the RSC layer is not specified in any formal syntax, which uh, in UMTS at least is very uncommon. So it's just like an, I, uh, an IETF RFC for, for common protocols you find on the internet where there's a human readable description but not a formal syntax describes the messages. However, the next higher layer, the RSC layer, is again specified but not in CSN1. This time they switch to ASN1 um, and use packed encoding rules, PER, um, uh, in order to avoid the overhead uh, that BER or DER would bring with itself. RSC itself um, takes care of measurement control, ciphering control, paging, radio bearer management, so which channels to use and so on, uh, broadcasting system information, and also has integrity uh, checking. Um, the RRC corresponds to the RR layer on, on, on GPRS. The PDCP is the replacement for SNDCP. Not quite sure. Uh, they could have used SNDCP. I don't really see much difference between those protocols, but they just are different and have a different name. Um, it uh, handles user data payload and header compression. Um, it, uh, there is a new uh, compression scheme, ROHC, that GPRS doesn't do. It's robust header compression. It allows you not only to compress the TCP and the IP header, but also RTP. So it's, in, it's, in, it's optimized for doing voice over IP, so you can compress away not only uh, RTP, UDP, and, and IP headers, and uh, get uh, rid of some of the overhead involved. Um, it's between the, the user IP, uh, uh, the PDCP is between the user IP and RLC. If you look at this, uh, it's, it's here in that layer. It's the, what immediately what comes below your IP uh, messages. Uh, the RAN app protocol is between the, um, the uh, RNC and the SGSN. Um, it's again specified in ASN1, also uses PER encoding, never visible to the user. Um, however, the Vodafone UK and uh, Alcatel Lucent femtocells use RAN app um, also to the femtocell. So if you're into uh, looking at those devices, you will find RAN app in there. Um, there's also something called NBAP, the Node B application part, which then is between the RNC and the Node B. Again, specified in ASN1, again, not visible. However, there are some uh, Node Bs that sometimes you can buy from eBay. Um, and if you buy a real Node B, then you will have to implement that protocol to talk to it versus RANAP, which you need uh, on uh, the femto cells. Um, it's actually quite funny. Uh, I wouldn't have thought that a year or two ago uh, that you can buy um, large uh, UMDS uh, base stations now on eBay, but it's uh, not uh, horribly expensive. So sometimes it's like 1,500 euro or something. It's, yeah, it's not cheap, but if you consider that uh, from this uh, BTS you can serve something like 240 concurrent voice calls or something, it's uh, quite uh, impressive actually um, to find those devices. Uh, they often come from places like Singapore or Russia or the United States. Not sure, in Euro continental Europe you don't see that many being sold. Okay. The GTP layer between SGSN and GTSN is the same as in GPRS. There's no real change. Some new well, information elements or something, but uh, that's uh, really it. There's no change at that point. Now, if we look into HSPA+, plus, um, the problem is if you go to the data rates that I have indicated, like these 180 megabits uh, theoretical maximum for a single base station, um, the uh, bottleneck, of course, becomes the SGSN because it's a centralized node where all the, the, um, the user traffic goes to because the SGSN takes care of the compression, decompression, encryption, decryption, retransmissions, and so, and so on. Uh, I think the fastest that I've seen you can buy is 40 gigabits throughput, but uh, most of them are actually smaller. And if you think about a, a, a network, like a nationwide network in Germany has about 20 to 30,000 cells. Um, and uh, well, if you think it, each, each of them would have a load of 20 megabits or something like that, you will see that uh, this is not sufficient. So HSPA plus uh, change in a way that they move, they move basically move a small SGSN into each node B, and then they talk GTP directly to the GGSN, which is not even on that picture. Um, so um, uh, they move core network functionality out to the edge of the network in order to distribute the load that's created by those high bandwidths. 
So the segmentation compression encryption is, is no longer on a centralized node, but it's it, at the base station uh, at the edge of a network. That's uh, a fairly significant change to the centralized architecture that uh, we had before. Um, okay, well, that's sort of my uh, quick run through uh, the various protocol stacks. Um, as you can see, there are many acronyms on the slides that I didn't even mention. Um, uh, and there's many more things that could be said and that can be learned. And there is more than a thousand PDF files, which each uh, hundreds to thousands of pages, uh, which uh, are ready for you to read. Um, and um, I encourage uh, everyone to uh, go where most people have not gone yet, uh, which is uh, to look at uh, cellular protocols and learn about technology and play with technology and not just leave it to Nokia, Siemens networks, Ericsson and Huawei to do that for you. Okay, thanks for the attention. We have some time left for <laughs> questions. Okay, so uh, we have about exactly 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, please all of you remain seated while we are doing the Q&A session because it interrupts the speaker and the rest of the audience who wants to listen. Um, if you have questions, please line up at the two microphones as always and uh, Harald will answer your question. Hello. Uh, uh, a couple of points. Uh, you said that everything is ATM all the way uh, to the node B and everything, but uh, in my experience, at least new installations will definitely use IP all the way because SDH and ATM are expensive and bad. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that's a bit dated or, or what. Um, uh, it is indeed um, correct that uh, more current equipment is replacing ATM with uh, Ethernet uh, over fiber optics with IP inside. Um, that's uh, true, but I didn't want to make it even more uh, complex than it is um, in the diagrams. Um, nevertheless, uh, there is still a lot of equipment out there um, that runs on ATM, um, and uh, they are. It depends a bit on the region. If you think of um, Western Europe and the US, I think uh, um, the uh, synchronous networks are more expensive. But if you think of uh, the, the less developed world, then they actually they um, they want uh, the 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 uh, TDM style networks uh, still even today. They don't want anything else. Yeah, uh, two more. Oh yeah, uh, the 3 GDT. I don't know if you use that term, but uh, terminating the GTPU in the RNC, uh, and I mean that's something you can uh, that's been implemented as well. So it doesn't always go through the SGSN or the mini SGSN in Node B. Yes, that's uh, correct. I mean, I, I did not claim that this presentation is a, a full, uh, comprehensive uh, overview about all the possible configurations yeah. of networks. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, definitely, there are options that you, uh, that you can do uh, for uh, uh, configuring networks differently. I mean, there also, uh, there are always vendor-specific uh, uh, um, changes. I mean, the reference architecture described by the specifications is not always followed to the last line by the individual uh, vendors. Even in GPRS, the PCU can be located inside the BTS or inside the BSC uh, or co-located with that, and different vendors have different implementations. So, um, yeah, but uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, just one uh, funny note on the GTPC protocol. You said it doesn't have any authentication, but there is the one bit that, said, uh, that says, uh, it's cool, I checked with the HLR, I am allowed to connect. The well, evil bit. I, I wouldn't call that authentication, but yes, it's a nice point to raise that there is a bit that says it has already been authenticated. Thank you. Um, so, Harald, Harald, thank you for your talk. Um, a question. Why is this so bloated? So much bloated? Because it's so error prone. So if they started to make UMTS, they could have said, okay, let's do a new network that is very simple and would work and is not so error prone. Because if you have all these layers and they have bugs in, in the layers and maybe some, some uh, range checking problems between the layers and the conversation enc encapsulation, stuff like that. Or you can make a layer, for example, you could embed a protocol inside a protocol and then if you unencapsulate it, you get the rest of the, of the protocol and you can, can fuss up everything. So if, yeah. you, if you, for example, make fake a protocol in the, in, in the lower layers and put it in the upper layer and, they, and then it starts to, to de, 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 um, de, um, 
the onion so so the layers so it puts the layers around away and then it sees oh there's something from the protocol that should be there and then you can fast the stuff okay um i think the number one wrong assumption to make is that um these uh, systems are designed to be uh i don't know to be reasonable or to be um to be uh, efficient. I mean, the number one design criterion is uh, every one of the, the industry representatives needs to make sure that all the patents they hold uh, apply to the specification. <laughs> so everyone needs to add something to the spec that makes sure that their own patent portfolio is represented in the spec. Um, the next uh, thing is that uh, there is a reasonable grounds to the suspicion that it's made artificially complex in order to keep uh, new market entrants and new competitors away, um, right? Because you have this existing club of manufacturers for equipment, and it's like five or six companies worldwide. Um, and if they would make something simple, then that would mean every random Joe would be able to implement this stuff. Um, and that's sort of, uh, of course, it's uh, very useful to have a complex system where only you with your, you know, thousands of engineers that are, know this stuff in and out can actually uh, implement it quickly um, and you, you keep the competition away. So that's sort of uh, thoughts that I would want to uh, give on as a feedback on that. Well, which uh, brings me uh, to my question. Are you aware of any open source uh, project that's working to implement the uh, uh, 3G, something like uh, OpenBSC, but for 3G? Well, the simple and sort of uh, simple excuse from my point of view, uh, from, my, from my side, would be well, as soon as you write it. But <laughs> um, more seriously speaking, um, uh, well, the, the, for the GGSN, there is an implementation, but that's yeah, well, very, very open, far away. Yeah, well, there's open GGSN and yeah. open GGSN, but... Uh, yeah. um, if you look at uh, the, the uh, things here, it's, um, I'm not aware of anyone having done any open source implementations here. There are a couple of people who did uh, some work with femtocells, um, but it's uh, not really in a way for operating femtocells. It's more, more for doing man-in-the-middle attacks and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we did some also, I mean, in the Osmocom project, we did some experimentation with all the major femtocell uh, architectures that we found, but it's mainly a, a question of um, priorities and, uh, and available developer time. So um, I, definitely it would be very helpful for somebody to, to work on those things, but uh, yeah, it takes, takes time, it's complex, and um, uh, we need more people working on this. Uh, okay, uh, thanks. Harald, a short question. What about LTE? Will the complexity be more or less? Different. They, different, but they, they <laughs> do the, <laughs> but they do the whole, whole okay. fucking uh, stacks and big and everything stacked about each, uh, uh, over each other. They uh, do the same. LTE, so let me, let me say one thing. All the things that I've talked to do not show you the complexity in layer one. No? The com <laughs> layer one is more complex than any of the diagrams on here. It's the radio layer uh, to the phone. And layer one of, uh, uh, of, of uh, 3G is already complex, but I think LTE is less complex. Also, it uses less, uh, how can I say, less um, industry-specific or uncommon, from, from an inter coming from the internet background, LTE is not using so many protocols that are completely unknown to, to, to people who have some, some non-mobile network experience. So it's more IP-based um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't do all this uh, E1 and ATM and so on crap from the beginning. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, then if you look at the security, for example, in LTE, all the different keys and certificates and everything involved, it's uh, already that is, uh, again, fairly complex. So um, complexity in different areas, maybe. What about test benches? So all these providers need test benches to test their equipment. And so it would be a huge uh, room of, uh, of, vec of, of vectors and states that you cannot test. So it would be, it would be so complicated that you cannot test the system. And so you get so many bugs uh, that, are, that go through maybe 10 years undetected. And so yes. if you do all these complex, complex systems, you will always fall over the bugs. Indeed, it's a problem. Um, it's a problem that starts to get recognized now. Um, but uh, still, I think uh, there's uh, not any, there's no specification anywhere, neither from the 3 pgpp nor from the GSMA, nor from individual operators that I would be aware of, which would require something like the most simple fuzz testing of any of these interfaces before delivering a product. 
So um, requirements wise, the requirements are always functional requirements. It has to work if everything is correct and if the message comes in like this, but there's never a specification that requires, uh, you know, uh, stability no matter what kind of random crap you throw at it. That doesn't exist and uh, it's sort of a bit difficult. Um, um, Dieter and I, we have been uh, in contact with a number of operators to do such kind of tests and some operators are actually open in us that they want to do that, um, but they get a lot of pressure from the equipment manufacturers to not do it. So there is an enormous, uh, enormous pressure on some of those operators to not uh, uh, do any of this testing on those interfaces, um, which uh, makes me quite suspicious. Okay, we have five minutes left, so we're going to take some questions from IRC. Wu Tang wants to know how hard would it be to host a man in the middle attack with a fake base station like an MC catcher for GPRS? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Could you please repeat it? How hard would it be to host a man in the middle attack with a fake base station like an MC catcher for GPRS? Well, um, so an MZ catcher is not more difficult than in GSM because it's the same authentication and it's only one-way authentication in GPRS as well. Doing a full man-in-the-middle attack is uh, more complicated, but the question is how, I mean, how realistic do you want to be? I mean, a full man-in-the-middle attack means that you're sitting in between the real network and the telephone and you're passing data from left to right and you, you're eavesdropping or you're modifying the content or something like that. That's relatively hard uh, given the fact that none of the GPRS encryption algorithms so far have been publicly released, uh, disclosed or anything like that. So it's completely unknown uh, so far. Um, and, uh, but I would make the point that it's not required to do that because most people just access the internet. So it's sufficient if you set up a false base station and you route the packets to the internet, like a false uh, Wi-Fi access point or something like that. And that's very, very easy to set up. Okay, another question. What is the overhead added to IP, TCP or HTTP in UMTS or GPRS? Oh, that's very, very hard to say because there's so many, first of all, on which interface, on, you know, on, on UU, IUB, IUPS, and so on and so on, there are many different interfaces. And the next uh, part is that uh, it's difficult to say because there's compression involved. And the question is how well can you compress the data or not? So it's, uh, it's not easy to say, um, but especially in GPRS, the overhead is uh, fairly large. Um, uh, if you think of something like um, doing VoIP over GPRS or Edge, then you have very, very small messages with your speech codec data, and then all these headers pushed in front of it, uh, the overhead is gigantic. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, looking at this from the user's perspective, um, I would do dial-up using PPP most of the time, um, which actually is the only protocol I'm missing on this slide. Is PPP actually used inside the network, or is it only something I talk to my modem? It depends. Um, <laughs> so a PDCP or a SNDCP, uh, those uh, encapsulation protocols, they have the capability of um, encapsulating either PPP or IP directly. Um, when you request the PDP context activation from your uh, modem, if you do that by AT plus PD, well, by IT commands, um, uh, then you can actually request which one you want to have. On a regular user interface, of course, you cannot. I would expect most of the uh, connections to uh, just use IP, um, and the PDP that you speak is terminated on the phone itself. Um, but if, if not, if the PDP is passed in here, then you have an additional layer below here, which is PDP, and it goes all the way back to the uh, GGSN, which then would decapsulate. Um, you, can, um, you don't need PPP for anything, really, because uh, uh, IP address, uh, for example, IPCP kind of options for assigning dynamic addresses can be done by PDCP or, um, uh, no, actually is done by, by, uh, G, uh, by the session management itself. Um, 
And uh, you can also encapsulate IPv6 directly in SNDCP or PDCP. You don't need that. Uh, um, uh, you don't need PPP really at that point. It would just add some more overhead. I don't. I don't see what would be the gain, uh, unless of course you would want to do something like Apple Talk over uh, over PPP over uh, GPRS. Would it be possible to put with some very weird protocols, so not IP, for example, put uh, ISDN over UMTS, or do maybe, um, maybe some, some uh, well, what's, what's also ArcNet over UMTS and some, some stuff? Would it be possible, or is it, is it a problem? Technically, it's possible. However, you would have to control both the mobile station and the GGSN. And um, while it is possible as a, as a business, it is possible to, to get your own GGSN attached to operators if you, if you uh, want to, for example, um, uh, as this, the example I mentioned with machine-to-machine -machine applications where you don't want to go to the real internet but you want to go to your own private network, it's possible to, to get a connection to this, but it's very expensive and not really, um, not really uh, done in... Um, in many cases. So technically, yes, um, but uh, I think uh, as a regular user, it's not uh, feasible for economic reasons. Is there an open source GGSN so you could do some weird stuff? Yes, uh, there is open GGSN, um, which, uh, yeah, you could modify, but the phone you would also have to modify and you would have to attach to that interface, which in a real network you cannot uh, easily uh, do. Okay, one last quick question. How many cryptographic algorithms which are secret are still there in GPRS and UMTS? In UMTS, none. Um, it's all specified. In uh, GPRS, there is GEA1 and GEA2, uh, GPRS encryption algorithm 1 and 2. Um, so I think it's those two, that's really it. Well, uh, yeah, encryption. For encryption, yes. Authentication, there are more unknown algorithms. Um, but um, how can I say it's unknown doesn't mean it's unknown to everybody um, so okay we're a little bit under pressure so we have to stop here um, for the next talk I think we have a small announcement to make but first of all let's thank Harald um, so just Come up here.